Uh, the morning panel really focused on this question of what the challenges are uh, to folks working inside and outside of traditional district and school structures vis-a-vis uh, -vis governance and, and to a certain extent uh, uh, how those uh, challenges have begun to be worked around. This panel is going to take up that latter mantra and really begin to look at how some of these traditional kinds of institutions, indeed some of the governing arrangements that the first panel described as problematic, how we are beginning to see changes, reforms, improvements, new kinds of approaches uh, across the country in, in trying to, to circumvent uh, these challenges inside of, of existing institutions, create new institutions that can get around um, some of these kinds of problems. And indeed, that is the, the title of our panel, Tradi Traditional Institutions in Flux. Um, it, it's funny, I should mention that uh, 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 Check or Finn gave us uh, the advice a couple of days ago as we we're thinking about giving the, the panel some marching orders. He said, well, just be sure that you all don't make it too academic. Um, and of course, the, the irony in that, that statement and that guidance is that this is a panel made up entirely uh, of academics, um, with the exception of Rick, who I suppose is a reformed uh, academic. Uh, but trying to get a bunch of academics to be non-academic is, is a governance challenge indeed for the chair. Um, but I know that they will do um, a, great, a great job. So we have a, a fantastic uh, group of, of people presenting here. Uh, I have learned a lot from each of them uh, inside of my my own career, very pleased that they're able to join us here today. Uh, I won't read full bios, although they're all very distinguished folks. Uh, you have the bios in your, uh, in your packet. Um, first up, and we're going to go in the order uh, that they're listed on the program. Uh, first up with a paper entitled, More Than the Mantra of Mayoral Control, Rethinking District Governance for the 21st Century, we have uh, Rick Hess, who's an educator, political scientist, uh, and an author and just an all-around enlightened, enlightenment and enlightened guy. Um, we have, uh, and with a co-author on that paper uh, of Livia Meeks, uh, we have next uh, Katie McDermott, uh, who's an associate professor of education and public policy at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Her paper title is The Next Wave of Standards-Based Reform, Interstate Standards and Testing Consortia. Uh, next up, we have Ken Wong, who's the chair of the education department at Brown University with a paper toward a new federal role in public education, the challenge of governance in performance-based federalism. Uh, moving on, we have Jeff Hennig present the last paper on the panel, The End of Educational Exceptionalism, The Rise of Education Executives in the White House, the State House, and the Mayor's Office. And then we will also have a discussant uh, who will offer some overview comments on the papers. Uh, Peg Gertz, she's a professor of education policy in the Graduate School of Education um, at U. Pen. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes for presentations from each of the individual authors as well as commentary uh, by Peg. The timekeepers are over there. We'll be flashing you various kinds of signals. Uh, and as we heard from the first panel, you don't want that buzzer uh, to sound. Sounds like you should be shooting a, you know, the, the basketball at the three-point shot in fading uh, moments. Uh, but you don't want that to happen. So please uh, keep up with the time. We want to have a lot of time for moderated discussion about 15 minutes of that, and then uh, also a good chunk of time uh, for question and answer from the audience. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Rick. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, terrific to be here. Um, I, I actually took Checker, I, I made the mistake of taking Checker's advice at face value, which was not to bring a PowerPoint. So now I look like the only kid who didn't do his homework, so <laughs> thanks much, Dr. Finn. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, I want to talk with you a little bit today uh, about traditional district governance, really about school boards and mayoral control, um, and why, for my money, most of the energy that we have spent uh, on this debate in the last 10, 15 years uh, has been largely misguided. Um, first off, I think it's absolutely fair to point out that the nation's school, uh, that, that, that school board governance is a mess. Um, I did a national study with the uh, National School Board Association back in 01. Uh, we redid a version of that study uh, in this past year with uh, also with Fordham. And, uh, you know, when you look at the composition of the nation's school boards, these are people who spend little money to get elected. They run on low turnout elections. Um, they're, they have strong uh, preferences for timid, cautious, ineffectual reforms. Uh, when you ask school board members what's going to make a difference, 85% uh, plus get excited about professional development. When you ask them about things like recruiting non-traditional educators, uh, when you ask them about uh, inter-district choice or school choice or charter schools, uh, majorities uh, express little or no interest in those kinds of reforms. So there is an enormous uh, inertial preference for the status quo. Uh, 
Um, and further, school boards are unaccountable in the sense that few people actually show up in their elections, uh, in the sense that majorities of American adults can't name any of their school board members, uh, in the sense that no, there are no partisan labels affixed to uh, names, so people don't even have the crude kind of two-party accountability, and that thanks to the progressive uh, legacy, most school board elections are off-cycle, which means you've really got to want to go out of your way to drag yourself out to vote for somebody you can't identify on issues about which you're uncertain. <laughs> uh, one result, as Terry Moe has uh, most, uh, 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 most thoroughly documented, is that school board elections tend to be dominated by uh, employees. Uh, most visibly uh, teachers, but also paraprofessionals, bus drivers, people who work for school districts. They have enormous incentives to show up and vote for certain candidates because these are the candidates who, with whom they will be negotiating their compensation. So Terry has pointed out in the case of California, for instance, uh, that more than 90% of incumbent school board members who are endorsed by the union win, uh, fewer than 50% of incumbents who are not endorsed by the union uh, win. These are huge, substantial numbers. All right, that's it helps explain much of the enthusiasm for mayoral control, uh, about which we have heard much uh, from folks including uh, Eli Broad, Secretary of Education Duncan, any number of others who have suggested that it is an important, I I indeed essential uh, remedy. Um, a, we've got 14,000 districts. When they have these conversations, they tend to be talking about maybe a set of 50 to 150 districts. That tends to fall out of the conversation. But even for those 50, 150, let me be clear, I generally am supportive of the shift to mayoral control. I don't think you could, I don't think you can get traction in a city like Boston or Chicago or New York um, absent mayoral control. That said, I think there has been an enormous overselling uh, of the benefits and the transformational impact of mayoral control. A Couple things going on. One, mayoral control has certain benefits, coherence, more accountability, People actually know who's in charge, but it also has real and explicit downsides. One is a lack of transparency. When mayors become, uh, when mayors are involved and have the ability to control the flow of information, you no longer have that fragmentation on the school board, which has its downsides, but also makes it easier for information to be emerge in various ways. Mayors have enormous incentive to keep a tight rein on what is shared regarding performance, cost, and the rest. Second. When we talk about um, interesting and promising results from mayoral control today, there tends to be a heavy degree of self-selection. The places where you see mayoral control see them because those mayors often fought uh, for control of the schools. I was out about five, six years ago working with some folks in Kansas City on this where the mayor was reluctant at best. Uh, if they had actually gone to mayoral control, I think it would have been a disappointing situation. Uh, the same situation came up uh, with Seattle in the last couple of years. Um, I think Paul Hill's up later and he can chat, if he's so inclined, about um, the stance that the Center for Reinventing Public Ed uh, took on that issue. Uh, a third is if we think about the fact that unions dominate school board elections because they, because they have an incentive to, the same is true, obviously, with mayors. Mayors also have strong incentives to be nice to unions. Uh, Steve Brill, um, in a couple of the interesting passages uh, in Class Warfare, pointed out some of the ways in which Mayor Bloomberg undercut Joel Klein uh, in order to keep uh, the unions aboard as he was running for re-election. And the notion that mayors are going to be less resistant to teacher unions is premised on the notion that they actually are going to have cross-cutting incentives. They have to respond to lots of folks in the community, all of which is true. But it is also the case that probably fewer folks will be actively involved in giving dollars and advocating around education than will the city's professionals. We saw this, for instance, in the uh, Vincent Gray, uh, Adrian Fenty primary in this uh, city about a year and a half ago when the teachers worked very ardently on behalf of Vincent Gray's challenge to Mayor Fenty because they were really, ha they were really eager to see Michelle Ree leave. And despite the fact that there were some corners of town where Michelle had uh, significant support, when, when it actually came, when push came to shove, education absolutely cut against the mayor, um, despite, you know, despite the notion that strong mayoral support for a strong reform agenda ought to have played well uh, with parents in the community. What all of that suggests, to my mind, is entirely consistent with the larger research on appointed versus elected officials, 
when it comes to overseeing any public entity, which is that there is no simple answer. When you look at public utilities, uh, research has generally suggested that appointed boards are better long-term fiscal stewards, but they are less responsive to consumer concerns. Appointed judges uh, tend to meet out different kinds of sentences than elected judges. Elected judges tend to be more lenient for most of their tenure and then harsher when they start to, when they're closer to standing for re-election. Whether or not one of these is good or bad policy depends on whether you think harsh sentences or lenient sentences are good policy, or whether you think um, public, uh, public officials ought to be more responsive to their constituents or better long-term fiscal stewards. All right. What, that's, what, what all of this means in my book is that I think in many ways we've been focusing on the wrong question. School boards are only one half of the progressive legacy of governance. The other half of the progressive legacy was a fascination with uniformity, with the notion that there was a scientifically appropriate way to manage public, public roles, um, that there's not a Republican or Democratic way to pave a road or run a school, and that therefore what we wanted to do was organize this in careful hierarchies with superintendents and principals and assistant principals, and we wanted to write careful rules about compensation and hiring and firing. And what you see, even in mayoral control situations, is little effort to rethink the fundamental premises of these, uh, of these governing assumptions. Now, these governing assumptions are very much tied up with the notion that we are going to have serial monopolies running schools across this country. A century ago, it was 90,000 districts. Today, it's 14,000 districts. And the notion is that each of these districts will be a self-contained monopoly in which the folks in charge are going to make sure that every child Every child in that geographic catchment area will have every need met by this district. Trick is, when you're trying to do everything for everybody, it's hard to do any of it well. This is not unique to schooling. We saw similar dynamics uh, throughout the 20th century. A century ago, if you wanted to buy eyeglasses or a tractor, you went to Sears and Roebuck. Today, that's no longer the case because transportation, communication, delivery of services have made it much easier to specialize delivering nationally in scope. That is rarely the case in education, in particular when we think about digital delivery or when we think about CMOs, we see them twisting themselves into pretzels in order to figure out how do you negotiate delivery agreements with districts. So the KIPP schools in New Jersey are called team schools. Why? Because New Jersey has laws on the books that don't permit national providers to set up shop so KIPP is KIPP, except that it's team, which confuses the brand, which makes it harder for digital providers who are running through districts to be held accountable or to build a brand for quality if they're doing good work. So what I think we need to do is rather than just talk about who ought to be at the helm of this foundering ship of governance, what we need to talk about is whether our underlying assumptions, how we organize systems, our assumptions of geographic monopolies whether or not those continue to make sense a century, a century and a half after the political, the social, and the technological justifications for the original arrangements um, have functionally evolved. Thanks much. Ready? Uh, I, I promise not to be too academic, um, which I think in practice means that I won't complain about the room we're in or about my parking space. <laughs> um, the governance innovation that I've been working on for this chapter is the new interstate consortia for common education standards and tests. At this point, there are 45 states that have signed on to the common core standards. Interstate collaboration itself isn't a new thing. It's been done in numerous policy areas, um, particularly in environmental policy. In education, it's been seen as an effort to overcome some of the problems with the existing federal and state division of authority over standards, tests, and accountability. Oops, sorry. So the, the problems with the existing system that the common standards are meant to address are the variability of academic standards across the states and frequently the low level of standards across states, the quality of the assessments themselves. There's a lot of machine scored multiple choice. 
less of the kind of questions that require students to write or to show their work on a math problem. There's also a lack of what um, Smith and O'Day called a system of instructional guidance which you can think of as the kinds of assistance or instructional materials or training that enable schools and teachers to respond constructively when they're under accountability pressure as opposed to you know, deer in the headlights or panicking or randomly drilling students on things. There's also a political problem that the, that the standards are seen as a solution to, which is the deep-seated resistance to federal curriculum or testing. So what we have instead now are uh, standards that are set nationally that the states have chosen to sign on to. And I hope that my visual here simplifies things rather than complicating them, but it is kind of a complicated setup. The current press for multi-state standards, um, you can see part of its origin in the American Diploma Project, which was an initiative of the Council of Chief State School Officers, the NGA, and ACHIEVE. Um, by 2005, the ADP had benchmarked 22 state standards which meant logically then that those 22 state standards were getting fairly close to each other. Uh, common standards work have also been, in general, a priority of both the NGA and the chief state school officers over the years. They created an international benchmarking advisory group. Sorry, I'm missing a couple pits here. Uh, Hewlett and Gates have been supporting the ADP. Uh, the new Common Core comes out of the international benchmarking advisory group's work in 2008. Um, there's also some of the same foundation work. At this point, 45 states, as I said, have signed on to the standards, um, inspired in many cases by the fact that they are one of the criteria for receiving a Race to the Top grant from the U.S. Department of Education. Now, along with these uh, multi-state standards, there are two multi-state assessment consortia. The, both assessments are based on the common set of standards. The U.S. Department of Education had a, a separate competition for um, states to come together and bid on or to get money from the feds to develop assessments. Uh, one of these consortia is the Smarter Balanced Consortium, whose fiscal agent is the Washington State Department of Education, and their project management is coming from WestEd out in San Francisco. Um, there's also PARC, the Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. Their fiscal agent is the Florida Department of Education, and their project management is from ACHIEVE, which you saw in the previous slide, has been involved in this movement all along. Uh, there's a foundation role, again, in both of these consortia. And then the U.S. Department of Education, after making the original grants for the assessments, made a separate set of grants to the consortia to help them develop um, instructional materials and other sorts of resources for help to help with the implementation of the standards. Now the ways in which this is supposed to improve on the existing system are that the, the common standards are designed to be of higher, higher quality, higher difficulty than what many states were previously doing. It's also an opportunity potentially to get better, higher quality assessments without spending a lot more money on them because the cost of developing assess the assessments is shared more broadly. And then there are uh, more implementation resources available around these assessments than previously at a lot of state levels. There are some governance challenges that come up anytime you have one of these consortia of multiple public and private organizations. Um, in this particular case, one, I think, an, a challenge that's going to be interesting to watch going forward is we have the content standards, which are common, but each of the assessments, there'll be a, pro, a technical process of setting the performance standards for, for the tests. What does it mean to be advanced, proficient, whatever labels they end up using? And the, it's, it's possible that the two assessments' performance standards may come out a little bit differently. So we won't, in practice, it might feel more like two sets of standards than one, um, a lot of people would view that as an improvement on the existing system of dozens of sets of standards, um, but it is still, it's not quite the same thing as a single system. Um, there's going to be the same kind of capacity building challenges that have always existed in standards-based education reform will come up again now. 
there are many vendors involved in making and selling products and services connected to the standards. Um, there may ultimately need to be something like a good housekeeping seal of approval, like yes, these are in fact uh, aligned with the standards. Somebody that I spoke with for this paper referred to it as sort of brand management, that if you've got these standards that are meant to be high quality, you might want to make sure that what's being done in its name is also of high quality. And then finally, accountability, both um, the kind of uh, mechanical accountability for how money is spent, but also political accountability. If I, as a citizen of Massachusetts, I have a better sense of where to complain if I don't like the state's education standards then I'm going to, when we switch to the park assessment, you know, do I call somebody in Florida, do I call somebody in Boston? It's a more complicated setup for citizens. There is, though, a predecessor of what's been going on nationally, which is the New England Common Assessment Program. It's a very small scale. It's four very small states that decided to work together to meet No Child Left Behind requirements, but keep up uh, the kind of sophistication they wanted in their assessment. Um, I mentioned on the last slide that some of the, just the mechanical accountability questions are challenging. I'll give you a, an example from, the, from NECAP, which is what this assessment program is called popularly. The, the, the four states originally wanted to have one contract with, me with measured progress, their test vendor. But it turned out that nobody could figure out how to do that bureaucratically. The, the states just aren't set up for it. So what they ended up doing was getting together as the, the four assessment directors and coming up with an identical request for proposals that all four states issued separately. So all four states have separate contracts with measured progress. They've been getting a lot of coordination help from the Center for Improvement of Educational Assessment. So it's, it's all in practice has turned out to be less complicated than it might sound like from that example that I gave. And it's really because on this small scale, it's pretty easy for the four states to come up with what they call gentle persons agreements. You know, they, they don't have a single contract, but they've all agreed to use the same contract. They are really excited, the people I talked with in the states, about the quality of the assessment that they've gotten. They think they have better decisions made with more people involved, but it takes even longer than it took them to run their single state assessment programs. I heard particularly from people in Rhode Island that the multi-state nature of the test provided leverage for school improvement. And there really hasn't been a lot of controversy at the state level about ceding some authority to a multi-state consortium. What makes, what's made this possible is the small scale, the relative homogeneity of the states. Um, you know, people in New England might uh, quibble with that and say, no, Rhode Island and Vermont have nothing in common. But Rhode Island and Vermont have a lot more in common than Massachusetts and Florida or Connecticut and Hawaii or some of the combinations of states in the big consortia. The federal policy consortia, uh, the federal policy environment for the consortia has also stayed pretty constant. At the national level, everything is going to be more complicated. The federal policy environment is, I think, fairly uncertain at this point. Political sustainability is going to be a challenge. Um, right now, the, low, the public is not particularly aware of what's going on, but um, you know, in, the, in the future, there's, the potential, there's potential for backlash at the state level. So I think the bottom line is that this is a promising answer to the question of how to set standards in a federal system but it's an answer that actually raises even more questions. Okay, so my paper is um, on the changing federal role. So when we consider federal role historically, I mean, there are characterization that the federal government has been a junior partner in terms of uh, fiscal support. So if you look at uh, funding distribution, approximately somewhere around uh, maybe 7.5 to 10 percent of the dollars are actually coming from the federal government. So it is indeed a junior partner. And in terms of a lot of the, the responsibilities in terms of personnel certification uh, uh, and uh, the scope of services and so on, they are all lies at the state and the local level. So the federal government has always been described as kind of permissive and uh, have not been too assertive. But things have changed quite a bit since uh, 2001 because of No Child Left Behind. So my paper really thinks about the new paradigm in terms of shifting to a more assertive, more active 
uh, federal role. So since the 1960s uh, to uh, the year uh, 2011, we have about 45 to 50 years of federal uh, uh, activities. And how do we make some sense out of this? So in this paper, I ask three questions. And the first one is that how do some of these latest policy developments, such as Race to the Top and uh, I3 grant and um, as well as No Child Left Behind, how do all these uh, federal new initiatives uh, different from the traditional way of federal involvement, mainly through the categorical programs? And the second question is that what are some of the governing challenges as a result of this paradigm shift from one that is more based on categorical support into one that is more outcome based? And the third question is uh, really Cheka's question and this challenge, uh, challenging question is that uh, are all of these federal activities sustainable? And uh, what will happen in the context of 2012 election? And I'm going to venture into this uh, risky territory a little bit in just a minute and, 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 and share with you some preliminary ideas that I have on that changing political context and how it affects federal education, federalism. So the um, one very important approach that I take is that since I'm a political scientist by training, I'm very interested in the institution of governance. And institutional behavior is such that we need to think about this layering effect. And that is over the last 45 years or so, the federal government has shifted from the passage of ESEA in 1965 into uh, Nation at Risk 1983 and then into all kinds of uh, new initiative all the way to race to the top. And the important approach that I take is that each wave of these new federal initiatives actually did not really wipe out or dismantle the previous, the preceding set of layers of regulations and, and expectations, but instead we add on top to one another. So in other words, the Obama administration right now have to not only manage uh, managers the new initiative like the I3 and the Race to the Top and the TIF funds and so on. But over a long period of time, there has been a cumulative effect on these categorical regulations and the drive to make sure that those funding are used in a compliant way. And they have to also monitor what, was go what has been going on uh, based on these previous uh, regulations and decisions made by, previous, made by their predecessors. So the, the challenge of the federal government is really how do you create new things and at the same time be more efficient uh, in, in, in running the operation and the machinery of the intergovernmental administrative system, and which create a lot of complexity because every time a new administration comes in, they multiply a lot of these federal functions and responsibilities. And so I just want to put it on the table as the context so when we think about restructuring federal role, it's a very complex, it's not just let's create more program, but instead we need to think about creating more programs, but what about the other stuff that has been going on for the last 45 years? So uh, one way that I propose that we can think about is to think about some kind of a framework. And this may not, the folks at the back may not have a difficult time to seeing it, but it's all in the paper. So, and you can take my words for it. Uh, so the, the, the three analytical phases that I identify as the categorical phases that started with the passage of ESEA Title I 1965 and on, on going up until the present moment. Why is that? Because we still keep all these federal regulations. Uh, Non-supplanting is still there. Comparability is still there. Maintenance of effort is still around. So all of these federal regulations and guidelines still uh, affect the way federal government behaves. But at the same time, since NCLB, we started to shift from one that is based on access and equity and equal funding, which is more input-based paradigm, into one that is more outcome-based accountability. That is, because of NCLB, we want uh, every district, every school to be accountable and, 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 and in terms of uh, student outcomes, even though the state continues to control how to measure, as Katie was talking about, performance assessment is all lies at the state, how to measure proficiency. But at the same time, there are general federal framework that expect the state and the, and the, and the district and the, and the students uh, to, uh, to, to meet. And so this shift from an input uh, base into an outcome-based accountability, I think is a transformative uh, shift. 
And then more recently, because of Race to the Top, I argue that the Obama administration has shifted even more into institutional uh, innovation. But it's all federally driven institutional innovation. Now bear in mind that there are a lot of innovation that we've heard from the first panel uh, that actually uh, originates from the state and the local level and also from the nonprofit and the private sector. But what I'm talking about here is the federally driven institutional uh, innovation. These are the kinds of things that the, uh, the, the assurances that are built into the application process of uh, Race to the Top. So as you can see, that as we shift from one phase to the other, from categorical to performance-based into the, the latest institutional innovation performance-based phase, uh, you can see that uh, the tools for supporting these kind of federal policy have changed and broadened as well. So in the uh, previous, in the first phase, we rely primarily on single-purpose categorical fundings. For example, IDEA, Title I, and so on. And these are very restricted in terms of eligibility, in terms of uh, uh, what uh, the purposes of uh, using uh, those funds and so on. Uh, whereas more recently, we are moving into more competitive grants making. Whereas as a carrot and stick, that is in order to be eligible to compete for these grants, like the Race to the Top or I3, uh, these uh, applicants have to meet certain assurances or federally driven standards. For example, the educator's accountability or the student uh, uh, individually identifiable student data tracking system, or expansion of charter school, or more equitable distribution of school funding in your state. So these are the kind of initiative pushed down uh, from the Obama administration that uh, hopefully will uh, bring about institutional reform and innovation. Now there are of course a lot of tensions in the, in the governmental system, and I'm not going to go into detail except that uh, more recently the biggest challenge is really the capacity gap that is, there are these expectations coming from the federal government. The challenge is that how do state and local agencies be able to handle these expectations uh, without changing their way of doing business? And I think that's really a lot of tension uh, that we are seeing. And as a result, we are seeing the emergence of new actors. So the governors are now more involved and the mayors are a lot more involved, as uh, Rick was suggesting. And what I want to also emphasize that the union influence has not been reduced because of some of these competitive grants because part of the assurance is for them to be a part of this signing off process. And, and it's driven down by the federal government. So this labor management model uh, has taken on new articulation. And the networks is another new set of actors that I want to emphasize is the network of diverse service providers, the, uh, the CMOs, and, and, and so on. So what will happen as a result of the 2012, are uh, these, all these uh, you know, new activities sustainable? I think it depends on who wins the presidency and who controls the Congress, and so, uh, which, is, which is understandable, right? But what I'm trying to argue is that if Obama is going to continue on as our, uh, in the second term, I think the federally driven institutional innovation is going to continue big time. And I think this uh, race to the top paradigm is going to continue. I-3 is going to continue with the support of the democratic controlled Congress. But if the Republican continues to control the Congress, I think the innovation uh, initiative is going to be under tremendous fiscal discipline. Now, what if a Republican uh, wins the presidency? Then we are going to see a lot more state-based innovation. And if the Congress is also uh, controlled by uh, uh, Republican, then we are going to see significant limitation of federal direction and revisiting some of the, uh, the layers that I talk about because the Republican Congress and the presidency would be in a, a stronger political position to actually revisit some of the layer, layering politics uh, in, 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 in the past uh, 45 years. Thank you. My chapter takes off from mayoral control as a jumping point, but I argue in the chapter that mayoral control is just one element in a much broader structural change, uh, one that's been going on for decades that we're still in the middle of, a slow tectonic change that I refer to as the end of, a, of exceptionalism in American education. And by that, I, I don't mean as commonly used exceptionalism, meaning U.S. versus other countries, although there's an element of that, but education as distinct from other domestic policy issues. Uh, 
with the main difference being, and as it's been alluded to at, at various points already today, education historically in the U.S. has been uh, dominated by single purpose, issue specific arenas of decision making. Uh, and, and my uh, suggestion is that we're seeing a broad, slow uh, reabsorption of education governance and policy into general purpose institutions and politics, things like mayors and governors and presidents, but also, as I'll mention briefly, legislatures and courts, and that that has implications. I mean, in a sense, it's been an anomaly from the beginning, the way education is structured in the U.S. Key decisions uh, establishing a separate governance arena for schools were made a century ago when the stakes were much lower, the interest group configurations were much different, but once in place, they came to be strongly protected by various interest groups, including but not limited to the teachers' unions, parents as well, and an allegiance to localism. But I think too much is at stake, not just in terms of actual outcomes, but in terms of the $600 billion that was referred to earlier in jobs and contracts and the like, to expect that efforts to reincorporate education into general purpose arenas would fail to gain traction eventually, and I think that's what's been going on. Uh, in the chapter, I, I, I emphasize, you know, that this is not, first, that this is not just an issue of mayors. Mayoral control has been probably the more visible uh, manifestation recently, uh, but it's, um, uh, but uh, there's been shifts and parallel shifts in terms of uh, growing role of executives at the state and national level as well, and that these actually predate uh, mayoral control. Now, I'm going to move quickly here, I hope, uh, to just give you some evidence of the sh that the shift is taking place and leave time to talk about some uh, implications. So let's just see if I can make this work. There. there we go. So from the 1930s onward, this, this slide presents the formal uh, selection criteria for chief state school officers in the states. In mayoral control, part of the um, uh, institutional uh, manifestation of mayoral control is mayors appointing uh, school boards and, in many cases, directly state school superintendents. So from the 30s onwards, the biggest change uh, in this, across the states is the drop in direct election of chief state school officers uh, by the people. Um, initially, that was a shift to election, uh, to, to uh, selection by state boards of education. But more recently, uh, there's been a growth in governor's role as a, a appointing chief state school officers. Uh, since between 1967 and 2000, the number of states in which the governors had responsibility for selecting the chief state school officer increased by more than three times. Uh, at the same time, and I'm not going to present a, a figure on this, um, governors have had an increasing role in appointing the state boards of education. Uh, uh, so that um, in 2010, the governors had the power to appoint all of the members of the state board of education in 31 states compared to, in 1949, only 12. Now, formal power is one thing. In what, actually, using power is another thing. Uh, you have uh, governors and mayors who have formal power that they don't exploit, and you have governors and mayors who lack formal power but nonetheless use their bully pulpit. I tried um, in the paper um, to get a little bit at informal power, whether governors really put education on their agenda, and I took advantage of the fact that the National Governors Association has on its website biographies of all the governors ever in, in, in the country. We mm -hmm. coded that. Uh, just in, to see whether in the short two paragraph or so bios, K-12 to education was uh, mentioned. So this is data aggregated for 2,300 plus governors. And what you can see quickly is just that there's been a growth in, uh, uh, in the um, percentage of governors who, for whom education was significantly enough of their career that it made it into these, into these bios. Um, very quickly, presidents, this is just a, a recording using data from the Policy Agendas Project uh, uh, undertaken by political scientist Brian Jones and Frank Baumgartner, which coded uh, presidential uh, um, uh, State of the Union addresses. And this is mentions of education percentage of, me of, of the speeches. Of the, they use this uh, quasi-sentence uh, 
indicator. And, and, and I'll just simply point out that, the, you know, that there's a clear increase. Overall, the, the three presidents who were first elected after a nation at risk gave more than two and a half times the relative emphasis to education than the seven who preceded them. Obama's not on here, we can talk about that, but, um, uh, but um, this, the website Smart Politics coded similarly his addresses to Congress. And in uh, the 2011 State of the Union, education had more uh, mentions than any of, of, other, of the other 26 issues that they coded for. Now this could be specific to executives. There are arguments that suggest that maybe in an increasingly complex world, there's more need for and emphasis on management skills. Executives um, are turned to in order to um, uh, put some order in what's been described variously as a chaotic environment. Um, I argue, uh, you know, and if that's the case, it would be important. I mean, governors are important, and they, and they uh, not only are important as managers, they have political constituencies that differ from those of legislatures and school boards. But I argue in the paper that it's not restricted to governors and, and presidents and mayors, uh, that when governors, presidents, and mayors get involved, legislatures uh, uh, often get involved uh, as, as well. Uh, I, I, I report in the paper a little bit on how city councils um, get more involved in education uh, under mayoral control uh, cities. This uh, figure very quickly just shows congressional um, attention to education and school and uh, congressional hearings over time. Let, let me use my very few minutes left to say something about what, what, who should, who should, why should we care? What are the implications? Um, I think there are, that one of the implications is that unconventional ideas for delivering education are more likely to get a hearing in these general purpose uh, uh, decision arenas than in special purpose uh, decision ar arenas uh, dominated by educators. Um, that's partly because the mix of interest groups is wider. Uh, 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 policy entrepreneurs who don't have traditional education credentials can get a hearing in front of these bodies. And it's also probably due to the fact that there are different backgrounds and uh, experiences of general purpose uh, officials, elected officials, than of school board members. For those frustrated um, with what they consider to be the complacency, lack of imagination, or self-serving bureaucracy uh, of the uh, status quo, these changes uh, are likely to be welcome. But there are also some risks. Uh, while it's reasonable to be suspicious of the notion that the only expertise worth valuing is that steeped in the particularities of education and classroom experience, it's also totally unreasonable to assume that these traditionally recognized forms of expertise are not important. Cohen and Moffat in their book, uh, Ordeal of Equality, I think make a compelling case that much of the energies and resources that have been burned in contemporary efforts at to, to reform education have lacked traction precisely because they were disconnected from knowledge about aims, instruments, capabilities, and the environment that shape education practice and determine its consequences. Another risk is that investment in education will not fare well in the broader arena of general purpose government. The initial expansion of, of mayoral control and, and the occasional uh, high visibility education uh, governors usually rides on a wave of broad enthusiasm for the importance of education at the time, but there's no guarantee that that enthusiasm uh, stays as strong, especially in arenas, general purpose arenas, where education must compete in a more head-to-head -head basis with other demands on government attention, as well as arguments for alter the alternative strategy of cutting spending and taxing overall. As a necessity, and at the least, I think education advocates will need to find more and better ways to work in multi-issue coalitions in order to compete in these general purpose arenas. Uh, while the political challenges of operating in broader multi-issue arenas make it more likely that the initial posture of these interest groups, these traditional education interests, will be defensive, one potentially positive outcome, and I'm going to end on this, of, of a movement to general purpose arenas is that the pressure for multi-issue uh, coalitions and the fact that the uh, uh, leadership, the, the legislatures and executives themselves deal with education along with a broad range of other issues, I believe does open up possibilities for breaking out of what I consider the stale uh, argument of schools versus 
non-school factors and beginning to attend more seriously to the way that issues in education and issues in housing, poverty, social services, and public health intertwine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my assignment was to look across these four excellent papers and identify some common threads and overarching unanswered questions. As I read them, the papers collectively raised four questions that we need to consider as we rethink our education governance system for the 21st century. Uh, these four questions are, what do we mean by governance? What are the institutional boundaries within the education governance system? Where is the quote unquote democratic in education governance? And is there a necessary relationship between structure and practice? So what do we mean by governance? Uh, perhaps because of the era in which I was trained, I associate the term governance with the institutions that have legal authority in a policy arena. And that would be the first column on this table. But as the papers make clear, education governance encompasses more than just structure. It's the interplay of formal authority, political influence, or the policy influentials in the middle column, and policy instruments on the far right, or what we may say, the what, who, and how of governance. As we've been hearing, the education governance system's been changing over time. But I would argue this is due more to the realignment of authority within the existing structure, the expansion of and shifts in policy influentials, and changes in the use of policy instruments than to changes in formal structure and authority. Most of the structural, structural change has occurred at the local level in the form of mayoral control, charter schools, local school councils, and parental choice in both the public and the private sector. At the state level, structural change has been limited to some expansion of voter involvement through initiative and referendum, and as Jeff pointed out, the ways in which chief state school officers and state board of education members are selected, but not in their authority. The centralization of standards, assessments, accountability, and teacher policy at the state level is merely the state reasserting is constitutional authority in these areas, taking back control over functions that had traditionally delegated to local school districts. Um, as I was taught many years ago in my state and local government course, uh, local school districts are creations of the state. Uh, what the state giveth, the uh, state can take. Um, as Jeff points out in his paper, this change in responsibility has led to an expansion of and shifts in the political influence of policy actors. Um, and I sort of I listed some of those policy influentials um, in that middle column to executives who have limited legal authority in education at the state and federal level, from teacher and education interest groups to non-education interest groups particularly as education policy gets made in the general pur purpose arenas, and from actors at the local level to actors in the state level of the system. And we've also seen changes in the use of policy instruments as way of influencing behavior in our fragmented and decentralized education system. There's been a great deal of discussion of and research on how the federal government has used inducements which are strings attached to get a categorical funding and competitive grants to drive changes in state and local agendas, policies, and programs. As both Ken and Katie point out in their papers, some of the regulations associate, associated with these funds also impact the types and influence of policy actors. Ken notes that NCLB and more recent federal reform initiatives have opened up the education delivery system to a broader set of providers, including for for-profit organizations, as well as reinforce the role of the school district in implementing reform initiatives. Katie discusses how NCLB and the recent assessment grants provided an incentive for states to form networks 
And indeed, networks have become increasingly important vehicles for building capacity at the state, district, and school levels. As all of the papers note, however, the success of inducements and other policy instruments depends on the willingness and capacity of states and locals to respond to these new policy demands and on the cost of compliance to the federal government to ensure that behavior changes. So as we look at these multiple components, we need to ask what are the key leverage points in changing the governance system? Second question, um, and I uh, have titled this space versus place, which is a, a, a term that um, Rick and Olivia uh, use. Their paper questions whether it still makes sense to organize education institutions around geography when advances in transportation and communication enable the delivery of services uh, across traditional institutional boundaries by diverse provider networks. So thus, are institutional structures such as school districts still relevant in the age of technology? And this leads us to consider and perhaps justify the roles of our current governing institutions. What is the role of a school district, for example, when the state now determines curriculum, administers assessments, and holds schools accountable, and when schools can acquire services that are more aligned with their specific needs from external providers. Um, for example, New Zealand doesn't have school districts, only the external ministry and schools, though each school has a governing board and education is centrally funded. Um, could states in the United States do this? Related question is, what are the boundaries of an education community? Who's included and why does it matter? Changes in technology and communications have also redefined our conceptions of community. Social networking, for example, has vastly expanded who we include in our, di our different communities, friends, colleagues, et cetera. And they've made the place of residence and work possibly less relevant. Expanding the venues in which where students attend school also has implications for how we define an education community. So um, this is leading to a redefinition of school community from a geographically defined one that includes the public to a service-based one limited to the members of the school. And as we heard uh, with the first panel, this disconnect has the potential of increasing the tension between collective and individual interests in education and of undermining public support of education which is critical for, among other things, the funding of schools, particularly at the local level. Um, similarly, proposals to abolish school boards and school districts have the potential to give the public even fewer reasons to support education. And um, Americans have a long-standing mistrust of centralized control, uh, witness the resurgence of the states' rights movement. So this discussion of the role of community in education governance leads me to my third question, where is the democratic in education governance? As we rethink our education governance structure, we need to look at how we ensure that the voice of parents and the public is heard. Um, in most communities, electing school boards and voting on school budgets, remember 44% of all our education revenue is raised locally. In my district, it's 90%. Um, these are way, the public's main vehicle for exercising democratic control of education. And one criticism of mayoral control is that it has not created sufficient mechanisms or roles for parental and community involvement in schools. As we centralize the governance of education further up the system from local districts to state government, a similar concern will be voiced. And very quickly, a final question, is there a necessary relationship between structure and practice? Um, this question was raised by a study by Elmore Peterson and McCarthy 15 years ago in their study of the effects of school restructuring on teaching practice. And they argue that one really needs to map backward from an understanding of practice to an understanding of what a good structure might be. 
because the relationships between structure and practice are complex and indeterminate. And I think this is a lesson that must be applied to, to discussions of changing the structure of our education governance system as well. What do we want and what are the structural changes or governance uh, changes that are going to get us there? Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, panelists, and thank you uh, very much, Peggy. You raised a lot of uh, important, uh, deep, complicated questions that, that all of us need to think about uh, in the context of, of reforming education governance. So now I'd like to give each panelist five seconds to answer uh, all of Peg's questions, and, <laughs> and then we can, we can move on. Uh, I don't know that we will be able to answer all of them in the time that we have, but if there are any particular uh, questions that, that she raised or points that you, the authors, want to make in response, we can take a few minutes to, to do so before I'll move on and make uh, some, some observations of my own and, and raise some questions for the panel as a whole to discuss. Any, any takers? I just wanted to say something quick that uh, Jeff's paper brought up. Um, the, this common standards movement and the states has been very much an executive-led idea. It's been the governors and the chief state school officers. And you know, as a, as a political scientist, I'm sort of watching this, waiting for the, the moment when the legislature strikes back. Um, it doesn't seem to have happened yet, but I think it's a, it's a possibility that bears watching. Great. Anyone else? Um, all right, great. I'm going to do something a little bit different than, than Mike did on, on the first um, panel. Um, rather than asking questions uh, pointed towards each author and, and towards each paper, I'd like to ask some broader thematic uh, questions centered really on providing uh, meaningful kinds of takeaways uh, for, for policymakers. We have, you know, these variety, really four different vantage points with inside of the system and looking at different levels and actors. And so I think each person can offer a different perspective uh, on the, the thematic questions that I'll, that I'll raise. You know, Rick noted at the beginning uh, that there are no easy answers uh, to the kinds of questions that we're discussing here. Um, that's certainly true, uh, but uh, policymakers don't like to hear that there are no easy answers, uh, and at least we can think about what kinds of insights can inform their thinking about uh, making policy uh, in this area. And I guess the first uh, one that I would put to you all um, is the need uh, for nuance uh, in thinking about governance. Um, and I, I hope that this will be one of the great contributions of, of this panel and, and your papers and also the volume as a whole. So much of the, the conversation and the debate around governance, uh, whenever there is such conversation, which as Chuck noted at the beginning, tends to be all too infrequent. But when there is the conversation about governance, typically the conversation centers on whether we need more centralization of governance or more decentralization of governance, or about which particular actor or institution inside a, a, of the governance system should be given the sort of the dominant role. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that your papers highlight uh, and that we really need to think more carefully about is that the real issue isn't about decentralization on the one hand uh, or centralization on the other, but figuring out, again, in a more nuanced way, what kinds of education decisions should be made at what level of government and by what types of institutions. And so, and I put to you, how might we help policymakers think about these questions from the, the, the perspectives that you're all operating in? Um, let, let me take on this um, um, very complex question. Um, so first of all, in, if we look at the federal government, it's very interesting in terms of the purpose of federal actions. And in the last 45 years, there has been a tremendous intensity in providing equal access and schooling opportunities. So I, in the paper, I described that as redistributive funding. So when I analyze all the funding in terms of how much the federal government has been spending in the last 40 years or so, about $6 out of every 10 federal dollars are actually allocated for redistributive purposes in K-12. And that is very interesting because both the Republican and the uh, Democratic uh, control over either the Congress or the presidency, they seem to converge toward this commitment that there is a function that the federal government ought to play and continue to play. So I'm seeing that as a continuation, more continuity than, than a cyclical you know, shift. 
And so that really raises the other question is that as the federal government shifts toward more outcome-based accountability, normally one would expect that that's an area where you see more decentralization because they are closer to where the services and the clients are and so on. And so what we are seeing is perhaps a division of responsibility on the outcome accountability function, and that is federal government is going to set some broad uh, frameworks. If you are failing, you are in trouble, and I'm going to come in and do some more you know, uh, intervention. Whereas the, the operational side, I'm seeing that, that that's the area where I'm seeing more diversity in terms of the the decentralized, uh, 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 try out different ideas and demonstration programs here and there. Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, Jeff? Well, I'll take a, 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 maybe a distinct cut at the nuance issue. You know, the issues we're talking about here today are uh, complex issues in multi-causal world, uh, and the, the kind of outcomes we're interested in, not just in terms of performance, but equity, are driven by a, a lot of different factors, but there are powerful pressures in the policy world to simplify your story and uh, come up with a real clear uh, um, package uh, to put on the table and to build support for it by implying that this will make a visible and measurable difference. I, I think that there is a seductive power to this notion of s simple solutions to complex problems. We see it at the issue at the level of individual interventions that become the panacea for a, a short period and are tried out someplace and are celebrated and then when they get uh, transferred elsewhere seem to uh, uh, dissipate and die a slow death. And the same thing can be true of, the, of governance solutions. Governance is not uh, there's not a right governance st uh, structure that's going to take us away from the complexity people have talked about. The too many cooks in the kitchen, I'm sorry to say, we have in American society a lot of cooks. We have good reasons for a lot of those cooks, you know, voicing their concerns and battling out over policy issues. So I, I think where nuance can help us is to moderate uh, some of the simple expectations because, and I'll end on this, because those simple expectations have helped to feed the cycle of enthusiasm and then disappointment when, when they, don't, they don't deliver uh, on the promises of the entrepreneurs who push them. I, I don't have answers, um, simple or otherwise, but I, it strikes me as at least possible that the way we're doing performance accountability now in the United States is backwards because there's a fairly um, uniform sequence of interventions that the federal government expects states to take in schools and districts, but that's being done on the basis of many, many different academic standards. And given that we don't know a lot about what states can best do to turn around schools, I think you can, you can make a coherent argument that, that the system should get switched around and we should have one set of standards and invite many different approaches to ensuring that schools meet those standards. Um, but one, one thing I've found both as, a, as an academic and then as a participant in local education politics is that it almost seems like there are they're sort of centralizer people and decentralizer people, and they're more like faith communities than they are <laughs> like anything rational. You know, I, I look at 50 different state standards and I say, wow, doesn't that drive you nuts? And then I have neighbors who look at the fact that Massachusetts has state curriculum standards and they say, doesn't it make you nuts that the four fourth grade teachers can't make up their own curricula? And I, you know, I realize it's just different ways of looking at the world. Rick, you wanna put your two cents? Uh, oh, sure. <clears throat> um, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is that running throughout this conversation is we built a system of schooling very deliberately. I mean, right, Horace Mann and the common school era, it was a batch process model. The idea was to get a lot of these kids um, into a place where we could Americanize them, particularly these Irish Catholics, and get them somewhere we could, you know, beat the Catholicism out of them and have them in the King James Bible. <laughs> and if you're going to do that, you build these buildings called schools and you get uh, poorly paid uh, people in the classrooms called women. Um, <laughs> And you build these districts to coordinate this stuff, and that's what we did. And the trick here is that we now want schools to do something profoundly different than we wanted them to do when we built the system. Um, but because of the way public institutions work, 
we don't, we're not allowed to go out and try to build from scratch. How would you go about solving what we want schools to solve today? Instead, we're in the business of trying to take what exists and retrofit it. And part of that is this layering point that Ken points to. As a policymaker, right, your incentives as a public official are to create stuff. It's a hell of a lot more fun to do Race to the Top or I-3 or, uh, you know, um, IASA or anything else than it is to prune the trees of overregulation or to strip uh, no longer necessary language out. So what you get is this layering effect Ken talks about. We get it at school districts, we get it at the state level, and we certainly get it at the federal level. And because of the game of telephone that's played in our system, from the feds giving direction to SEAs, down to LEAs, down to schools, at every step of the way you wind up with these um, intimidating renderings of what's prohibited or what's permitted so that you wind up freezing out autonomy and judgment. The huge problem there is that I think most of us across the spectrum think that what characterizes really good schools and really good classrooms is autonomy. It's autonomy in an environment where people are held responsible for results, but empowered to make good judgment, to use learning technology smart, to make good hiring decisions. And if you want that, what you want is fidelity of implementation. You want people who are in control of their school, in control of their classroom, and feel that they can do things well. And yet, when you look at most scaling of reforms, what they consist of, because of the way we've organized the system, because of place-based governance, because of regulation, most adoption of innovation entails District A sending an assistant soup and two principals out to District B for two and a half days of dog and pony shows, where they sit there and listen to somebody explain how they did whatever it was. They then fly back, mimic it, and it turns out not to work the same way. And then we scratch our heads and say, damn, that must not be the solution. Thanks, guys. Those were, <laughs> those were uh, great responses uh, to a difficult question. And, and when I uh, asked it, I was very nervous that I was going to hear the sound of you know, crickets chirping uh, in the back. And thank you guys for saving me from the crickets and for those great, uh, great responses. Let me ask one more question, uh, and then we'll turn it over, open it up for, for Q&A. Um, you know, the title of this panel is Traditional Institutions in Flux. And so my question to you um, is, are they in flux enough? Um, if we start from the premise, as, as Checker laid out and Paul and I laid out at the beginning, that, that existing arrangements are, are unsatisfactory, dysfunctional, not producing the outcomes or likely to produce the outcomes that we want, um, you know, is the pace and scope of the kinds of governance reforms currently underway that you all described, are they likely to bring about a major transformation uh, of education policy and outcomes, or are they really just sort of tinkering at the margins and, and thus a, a more radical systemic kind of change of the sort that Paul Hill is going to present on the last uh, panel of the day. Uh, is that more radical systemic change um, necessary? Uh, you know, I mean, though it's certainly under study, education governance is not a new problem, right? Uh, and so are the prospects for reforming education uh, governance better today, and if so, why? Now maybe the crickets come out. Well, I don't if, know. if you uh, go back to Peck's uh, uh, chart, there is a, a lot of act, institutional actors, right? So, so to start off with, there may be different solutions to this. One solution is to reduce the number of actors, right? For example, eliminating all the school boards uh, as the middle manager, it, uh, it, and then have the uh, statewide collective bargaining, for example, so you eliminate the, all these uh, individual unions in different districts and negotiating their own deals and things like that. So you could actually think about reducing the number of actors as one way to streamline and make the system more coherent. But then you are trading off against the democratic question that PAC asks us, and that is that unless we think of other ways to hold the system transparent and accountable, like Rick was talking about, then we still have to cope with these other actors on that big map. And my push for mayoral control, because my other head is, I've done a lot of work on mayoral control. And one way that I look at mayoral control is that you kind of streamline the number of actors with the appointed school board and so on. But at the same time, you hold the mayor accountable through the electoral process. Every four years, the mayor have to come before the voters. And maybe that's one way to think about streamlining this whole governance challenges. Well, yeah, in my old age, I find myself sounding more like a 
crusty neoconservative, but, um, but you know, I'd, I'd, I'd put in a pitch for going slow when you don't know where you're going. Um, and I, I think these are areas in which uh, there are a lot of interesting theories about how, how organizational change brings about changes in performance. Uh, but there's not a lot of knowledge about that. I mean, let's take charter schools, which now have been around for more than two decades. I, you know, there are a lot of folks that after a year or two, Minnesota and a couple of other states were saying, well, let's go, jump in, you know, charter everything. I think we know a lot more about charter schools, what they can do and what they can't do tw two decades later. Uh, so, uh, you know, so that's just a, a pitch for some of the benefits of, of experimentation, of, of decentralization, which leads different uh, 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 communities to try some of these things out, some more aggressively than others. And finally, I think you can, you know, smart people can outrun political constituencies, and that happens a lot and explains a lot of the turmoil in, in, in terms of policy, which is it's not enough to have a good idea and go there fast. If that's fine if you know for sure you're right and the results are going to become instantly manifest, but in the, in the real world of politics, you need to build a constituency and bring it along, and, and, and that takes time. I, I'm going to risk sounding like a New Deal Democrat for a minute if, if um, Jeff is doing his, his neoconservative <laughs> imitation. Um, I, I think there's also, although we should get away from the idea that there's ever an excuse for running a really bad school, it's also important to think about where else in society there might need to be flux if what we want is for kids to develop the capabilities that they need to function in college and careers. Um, it's, a lot of it comes from schools, but it doesn't all come from schools. Um, Finland and Japan look different from the United States in a lot of areas other than their school governance. Rick, do you want to? Uh, sure. Uh, a couple thoughts. I mean, I think one, no, most of what, <laughs> mo most of what passes for, you know, reform, and particularly governance reform, uh, is actually, I think, generally drawing ourselves tighter into these knots, partly because we take the building blocks of the common school era as the givens. And so when we talk about teacher quality, whether we're at 736 in Florida or 7 Bill 191 in Colorado, um, all of the assumptions are organized around the premise of a classroom teacher with 26 kids who's going to allow us to generate refined value-added scores for reading and math. And we will systematically, uh, from Columbus or Tallahassee or, you know, Matt, excuse me, not Columbus, from Denver or Tallahassee, I was just looking at you, Bob, when I got distracted. <laughs> Uh, we, we will identify all of the good teachers across the state. You know, I mean, this would have made, yeah, you know, I mean, this would have made the progressives proud. I mean, this is the epitome of, you know, uh, you, you know, Frederick Taylor's kind of dream state of how you run schools. You get a couple of really smart econometricians in the state capitol, and they tell everybody who's a good and bad teacher based on a battery of assessments. Um, so I think partly there's, and partly what feeds that is because the education space um, and I think in some ways it's the antithesis of something like foreign policy or defense studies, is so predominantly progressive that everybody in the space knows that there are certain things about how the world works. We're supposed to close achievement gaps. We're supposed to feel really guilty and cry a lot that poor kids are getting shafted. Um, if there's a good idea, we should try to mandate it from Washington because why should we allow people not to do good ideas? And so what happens, I think, in the space is there a, a, a set of fundamental biases about how the world works, um, which I think are problematic. And so what happens is rather than have clear and, and disciplined conversations about what is it that the federal government is equipped to do well and not equipped to do well, what we wind up with is laundry lists by the civil rights community of everything that seems to be nice we ought to do in Washington whether or not the federal government is actually equipped to do any of it well. So for me, partly it's not a question of just centralization or decentralization, but a question of really focusing and analyzing what do we know about what, is, what the feds are suited to do in our system. And I think there's a couple things. I talked about this to Harkin Enzi if you're interested. Um, but finally, I think the final point here is one of the perils is that those of us in this business really want to be relevant and want to give advice to policymakers. And so in order to do that, we narrow our field of vision, we uh, suck up to policymakers and foundations to try to talk about stuff that's immediately relevant because this is what they want to fund, what they want to talk about. And I think the real obligation of people like us in this room who don't actually do anything useful or educate kids or have to make votes 
Our job is to try to change the trajectory of what's possible, to try to educate and argue with our federal fellow citizens that their nervousness about, about structural change is misplaced and that they're holding on to arrangements and resisting changes with, what, with, in a way that is problematic because it consigns us to educating kids in systems that are dysfunctional. But instead of that kind of challenging dialogue with our fellow citizens, we wind up trying to cram into the end of the table so that we can talk to somebody who matters. And I think that is a, a failure on our part, and I think it, is, it impoverishes the national conversation around these issues. Um, great, and I think one last comment we'll open up for Q&A uh, is that something that several folks touched on that's a real challenge here is this, this temporal issue, right? Um, you know, we, we have to balance a sense of urgency, right, with a desire to, as Rick said, you know, address the educational inequities in our, in our educational system and the huge impact that they have on, on kids' lives um, with a sense of realism, right, about what it's going to take uh, to, to accomplish that and the time um, that it might take to accomplish that. And if Stephen Wilson on the last panel said it might take 20 years. Um, you know, I, I think there is a, a, an unwillingness for, for, for good bad reasons and, and bad reasons to wait um, the 20 years, but is that something that we're prepared um, to accept? So let me go ahead and turn it over to, uh, to the audience for questions and, and, and answers. Why don't we try to go to people who haven't had a chance to ask <coughs> a question yet? How about in the, in the back? Uh, thank you. Reggie Felton, National School Boards Association, local governance. Uh, my question has more to do about the whole issue of governance in our institutions. Um, today we, we're focused on education, but if we look at other institutions and other aspects of life in this nation, they're all being challenged. So for those of you who see this different model in terms of governance, uh, can, you, can you share your thoughts of how this affects other institutions, and given the fact that schools are expected to take more and more on from other failing institutions, uh, talk about how this actually would work. Does the New Deal Democrat want to take that one on? About, I mean, how better cooperation would work between, I'm a, I'm a little bit, I'm having trouble latching onto the, the central point of the question, but. to look beyond education since it is one of several institutions that are being challenged in America. And so do you see the same thing with private sector, with health care, with other facets of American life that must be judged and therefore as you, we move toward that model that you see, share with us how that all so, uh, works. Yeah, so, so good, that's a good question. So I think, A, a I don't think, I, I mean, I don't think I heard any particular models. I mean, I think we were all, we're all wringing our hands and going, we're confused. Um, but, but, but I think the question is a terrific one. One, let's keep in mind that if you uh, think about the research which is in the private sector, uh, that in the terrific uh, UChicago book, the OA book, Economic Turbulence, it was pointed out that the average lifespan of your typical Fortune 500 company is 50 years from inception to dissolution. So what typically happens is you get this sequential passing of the baton. Um, old, old organizations with their old structures of governance um, eventually are plowed under and replaced by the new. Uh, in healthcare and education, it's interesting because, as, uh, uh, you know, particularly education, as publicly operated, publicly funded entities, we don't get to take advantage of that kind uh, 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 of plowing under of the old. Um, what you, when you look at the private sector, when you look at nonprofits or for profits, um, what you have seen is, a, I would argue, a transformation from this notion of a, 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 a premium on localism uh, because. You needed a Sears and Roebuck in Chicago or St. Louis where they, they could actually put together the logistics of getting your tractor or toothbrush to town. And what has happened is changes in technology uh, regarding data storage, regarding communication, regarding transportation have dramatically lowered the premium on being able to get stuff together and in turn have allowed us to focus much more aggressively on whether you actually make, good, make goods that are of high quality or deliver services that are of high quality. And what I would argue is what we're, what we're talking about, whether the solution is to go to state or federal, 
whether in my preferred solution it's to think um, it, it, how do you get new forms of governance that are not strictly geographically obtained, but, but in any of these circumstances, what we're talking about is how do you pivot from the constraints of an old era to take advantage of new potentials in a new era? And I, I certainly, I, I hear your frustration about everything ending up in the schools that came from somewhere else, because I think that's, it's clear that a lot of that does happen, where there's some potential maybe in something like the, the Common Core Standards. Uh, maybe we can reinvent the same wheel a little bit less frequently at the local level. Um, it's not just reinventing the wheel, it's reinventing the same wheel 352 times. Um, these are huge intractable, or not entirely intractable, apparently intractable problems, and you know, governance is only part of the story. Sure, and I think you know one other point that has been made, and obviously this this focus on the poverty versus focus on the schools issue is is a huge one and has been swirling around a lot recently, but of course dates uh, going going back much farther. Um, you know, I think the one thing that that people who even who disagree on the question of how, uh, how much schools can do to close achievement gaps and, and, and those sorts of things. The one thing that we can agree on is we certainly, at the very least, uh, want to maximize the potential of schools uh, to produce uh, better outcomes um, for kids, uh, uh, for all kids. So I think that's sort of the, the premise that a lot of us are operating under um, here. Not that those other questions shouldn't be considered, but we're not dealing with those per se today. Uh, another question. Uh, I think there's one in the far, far back. We don't want to ignore you back there. Yeah. You could identify yourself too, that'd be great. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, I'm Mr. Lloyd. I'm a public school teacher in the state of Maryland. Um, recently, last Sunday, in the past few Sundays, the CNN have always featured about the educational system in the United States and sadly enough, we don't even figure in the top 20 when it comes to English, science, and math. And here in the United States, we put so much burden on the teachers, school administrators, education officials. Now my question is, when are we going to put the burden on the parents? The basic social fabric of our society is the family. The schools, the churches, the government is only part when the, student, when the students get to the classroom, they are half-finished individuals, and part of that is the background in the home. And in many cases, um, our home are sort of dysfunctional, and parents are not really um, doing their part in the education of the children. Now my question is, being educators here in this, in this room, and people involved in the educational sector, when are we going to make the parents accountable and how are we going to make the parents accountable for the failure or the low performance of their kids and not just pass on the failure to the teachers and the school administrators? Sure, I think, I think the, the parents question like the poverty question is a very difficult and very important one. I think uh, one of the focuses here from the governance uh, angle, right, is where we can think about policy having greater leverage uh, and less leverage, right? I, I think governing schools is really hard. Governing parents uh, is a little bit harder, um, for sure. Um, but certainly welcome to have other, other folks take a stab at that one. Well, we've just ascertained that I'm the only parent of current public school children on the panel. Oh, actually, true. You can, you can help out. Um, Governing kids, by the way, a lot yeah, harder right. than any of those other things, too. Yeah. Governing schools way easier, um, but it's 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 part of the same question, right? Is is what are the things? How can we do the best job of controlling the things that can be controlled from within the school system? I think is what we're asking here. I think this is where I think the local school boards really need to step up to the plate, and that is that. Uh, here is a big challenge of civic engagement. So building the civic capacity is such a big challenge across particular urban school districts. And, uh, and urban school boards have always been uh, having difficulty really mobilizing the parents. I serve on my mayor's uh, uh, task force right now to really reassess the whole system in Providence. Uh, 
And uh, time and again, there's communication, transparency, a lack of communication with the parents, and the report card is not uh, readable, understandable, data is not shared appropriately with the parents. So this whole challenge, this whole range of governing functions, uh, I think is very central to what local school board ought to be thinking about and be able to do better. And so I think we really need to uh, create a lot more outside monitoring functions. Perhaps the state might have to keep a close watch on what's going on and, uh, as far as the local school board communicate, community engagement functions are concerned. Yeah, even, even I, as somebody who studies this stuff professionally, when I got a letter from the school that my son was in preschool in telling me that the school wasn't making adequate yearly progress and that we had the right to transfer him to another school, I was four paragraphs in before I recognized, oh, this is the No Child Left Behind mandate, yeah. uh, you know, and, and you know, I, I do this, and I can only imagine what the translated versions of the letter were like. And there wasn't another preschool in town anyway in a public school. <laughs> <laughs> Not an irrelevant point. Uh, okay, can we get uh, one more question uh, right there in the black? Hi, I'm also um, an educator in Maryland, but I have a completely different question. It's about the Common Core Standards. Um, so I know that that was a mayoral choice. Those were decided by the governors, no, sorry, the governors decided to enact that, um, and that had a big trickle-down effect. I found out about it uh, a week before school started, actually. So my question is, what, what sort of training goes along with that? Because I know I had an hour and a half to prepare for the school year, I'm not even joking, with a completely new curriculum that we had, we had also received a new curriculum two years before that. So my question is, how does the race to the top funding, Common Core Standard, how does that actually apply to the teachers who then have to teach that material in that, a week? That's a great question. It's, it's <laughs> part of that um, building a system around these standards and assessments so that it's not you and the, uh, I don't know if you've done, if you've tried this, I've subscribed to a Google alert on Common Core State Standards. <laughs> and it's, it's mind boggling what shows up in my email, you know, products and services and online trainings and in-person trainings. And I think that, you know, certainly if we expect you as a teacher to make sense of this yourself individually, we're, we're asking for a lot of flux. I'm not sure it's the right sort of flux in the system. Uh, I mean, you j the, the, the way you sh should be comforted or not at all comforted is that the, the incoherence and confusion you're facing uh, is everywhere. Uh, colleges of education that are supposed to be retooling teacher prep around this have exactly as little heads up and exactly as little clue what's going on as you do. Uh, professional developers are making up products, but nobody actually knows what the specs are going to be. And of course, they're not actually allowed to talk to people at the two consortia designing the assessments, because that would be morally problematic. Uh, so I mean, th th well, this is an intriguing part of it, right? So, so you've got folks, uh, like some of our hosts at this fine event, who are enormously enthusiastic about the potential of the Common Core. But I, I, I think, you, you, you know, uh, Linda Darling Hammond and I have uh, analogized this to it was a really run first mile of a 26 mile marathon. But most people in the policy community are already patting themselves on the back. They're very enthusiastic. Uh, it's much like small schools circa 99 or any other innovation where once you have figured it out, everybody moves on, they get bored, they're ready to go solve another problem. And we now expect this stuff to just be casually implemented by 3 million plus teachers who will clearly figure it all out along the way. Okay, uh, I don't think we have time for any more questions. I just wanted to offer a couple of tensions that I observed uh, uh, across the different papers uh, to leave folks with as they go on uh, to our, our lunch uh, speaker, uh, New Jersey Education Commissioner Chris uh, Cerf, who I'm sure will answer all of these questions and resolve all these tensions that, that I'm raising. Uh, um, the first is this tension between um, accountability on the one hand and, and flexibility um, on the other. Right? We know from all the research on organizational behavior inside of education, beyond education, that, that uh, uh, for leaders uh, and, and workers right, to be effective, they need to have a considerable flexibility and discretion to sort of pursue um, their mission. And yet when uh, schools, teachers, principals fail, what we tend to get are centralized mandates from, from higher up that get placed uh, on increasing layers, as Ken talked about, that, that remove that flexibility and discretion. So how do we get out of that box 
uh, or that spiral uh, around uh, the tension between accountability and flexibility is a, is a tough one. The second tension is between um, governance um, by consensus um, and the need for rapid and transformative change, right? And we talked about this a little bit when I mentioned the temporal point. Um, as Ken noted, you know, inside of the race to the top, this was a real tension, and it's an ongoing tension, right? On the one hand, the Obama administration created this scoring rubric, rubric right, that said, well, we are going to push and incentivize states to embrace in, in these plans that they propose these, uh, you know, ambitious, uh, uh, controversial packages of reforms, um, and then we're also going to, you know, kind of require them in the point system for getting stakeholder buy-in from key groups that are typically change adverse. Right, and so that was a tough nut to kind of crack. Both are worthy goals, right? Trying to in, ambitious reforms, stakeholder buy-in, but there certainly is a tension uh, there, particularly when you put the time element um, in. And the third one uh, is a tension between um, stability and innovation, right? Uh, on the one hand, we talk a lot about innovation uh, and the need to do things uh, differently, right? Again, coming out of a sense that the existing way of doing things, standard operating procedures are, are, are inadequate or dysfunctional. Um, and yet, on the, on the other hand, we know, again, that for any particular innovation, right, uh, big or small, to be successful, it actually has to have some time uh, to, to work, right? Uh, we could declare a common core standards of failure in a year, for example, because we haven't been able to deliver the instructional materials to make it work, right? Uh, but so there's that tension between kind of, okay, well, it's moving on to the next thing. Rick um, identified the sort of the political incentives that that spur this uh, in his first book, Spinning Wheels, I think, and that's still very much fundamentally um, uh, a problem.